To all of you, my most sincere thank you. The annual Ridenauer Prizes recognize acts of truth-telling that protect the public interest, promote social justice, and illuminate a more just vision of society. But this award from the Nation Institute and the Fertel Foundation is about much more than honoring my actions. I come before you today to represent so many financial employees who tried to do their jobs, to do the right thing, but were punished for doing so. With me today are two other former countrywide executives, former Chief Leadership Officer Michael Winston and former Culture and Communications Officer Cinder Niamela. Although our responsibilities were diverse, our fates are tellingly alike. An often overlooked but important part of the countrywide story is the bravery evidenced by many employees who tried to stop the fraud, corruption, and deception. Mike Hudson, investigative journalist for iWatch News, while researching his series, The Great Mortgage Cover-Up, documented stories of 30 former countrywide employees that were victimized by that corrupt environment, including Michael and Cinder. They never wanted to become whistleblowers. They just wanted countrywide to do the right thing. They want it countrywide to follow its own ethics policies as well as the law. In the end, we were not only trying to save shareholders, taxpayers, and employees from Countrywide's malfeasant practices, we were trying to save Countrywide from itself. I never realized I would ultimately be labeled a whistleblower. I believed I was hired to improve investigations and reduce fraud. I simply set out to accomplish that. I came to learn that the true expectation was to conform and propagate the status quo. Countrywide wasn't just a rogue culture, it was a cult. And it was one that was welcomed instead of rejected by Bank of America. When I resisted and became a threat to the wrongdoing, I was swiftly dismissed, sending a chilling message to others. My experience with Countrywide has been a series of revelations. I imagine it wasn't unlike what Ron Reidenauer felt when he first heard an account of the events at My Lai. Utter disbelief, then shock. Only recently did I realize that Countrywide had perfected a single strategy, the same tactics lies, manipulations, fabrications used by the loan officers to push through infinite numbers of fraudulent loans were also used to systematically dispose of the whistleblowers who reported it and to protect the management that condoned it. This recipe was so successful it would also be embraced by corporate lawyers to defeat the claims that could expose and punish the wrongdoers. It is a strategy fully embraced by Bank of America. These lessons highlight the threat of ongoing efforts by corporate America to gut whistleblower provisions in the Dodd-Frank Act. Critics insist that a whistleblower be compelled to first report problems internally, supposedly to provide the corrupt company an opportunity to correct wrongdoing. But when I followed protocol and reported internally, I was summarily eliminated. The wrongdoing was protected, not corrected. We cannot allow corporate malfeasance to run rampant and become institutionalized. People need to know that many corporations use hotlines and reporting policies to silence whistleblowers and conceal fraud. Whistleblower defender and government accountability project attorney Thad Geyer reveals evidence of the true corporate intent in his analysis of whistleblower control strategies. Corporations now screen applicants for whistleblowing tendencies and assign lawyers to participate in internal investigations so they can shield the wrongdoing under a cloak of privilege. 
The Congress and state legislatures should eliminate the corporate lawyer cover-up by disallowing the use of so-called privileges in these circumstances. So here we are, several years after the onset of the financial crisis, caused in large part by reckless lending and risk taking in major financial institutions. And still, not one executive has been charged or imprisoned. This stands in stark contrast to the savings and loan debacle in the 1980s, where prosecutors sent more than 800 bank officials to jail. Our current administration has defended the lack of prosecutions by labeling the executive's actions bad behavior, but not illegal. Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer told Steve Croft of 60 Minutes that although the risk taking was offensive and the greed was upsetting, it didn't mean the DOJ could bring a criminal case. Perhaps we simply need a different means to a justifiable end. When prosecutors were unable to convict Al Capone of racketeering, they convicted him of tax evasion instead. <laughs> if there is insufficient legal evidence to convict these executives of what we believe are obvious crimes, then the federal government should refocus. Overwhelming evidence of perjury, witness tampering, and obstruction of justice exists in the numerous claims, court filings, and trial and investigative transcripts. We must not let these deeds go wholly unpunished. Perhaps financial industry whistleblowers should be permitted to present their information to the grand juries without the help of the government prosecutors. Then the people can decide how best to address this outrageous wrongdoing. We can and must uphold the law and prosecute those who break it, especially white collar criminals, no matter how highly placed or how cozy they are with government officials. We must insist on full and complete investigations with accountability and punishment for the guilty parties. We must keep the heat on and see justice done. So many financial industry leaders have failed themselves, their families, their shareholders, and their employees on the most important of leadership behaviors, honesty, integrity, and ethical decision making. We cannot excuse companies that abuse our trust. We are hoping that the media continues to carry this torch. Thank you again, Nation Institute, and Fertel Foundation for this award. Thank you to iWatch News' Mike Hudson and 60 Minutes' Steve Croft and James Jacoby for bringing these egregious acts to the public's attention. Thank you to my husband John and my family for their continued understanding and sacrifice. And for my dear friends Michael and Cinder for maintaining our collective sanity in an effort to defeat an allegedly untouchable foe. And then there are those that I can't thank enough. Gaps, Richard Condit, whistleblower defenders, Thad Geyer and Stephanie Ayers, and my brother-in-law, Matt Tonkovich, all of whom have dedicated many, many hours and legal resources to see these wrongdoers held accountable. Thank you all on behalf of those everywhere who speak truth to power, even in dark times. I will cherish this event. Thank you.